as students, employees, and colleagues. Most specifically at this Institute of MIT, we talk about technology, the products we can make, the sciences, the political events affecting our economy, the nature of our friendships and relationships. But there are a series of topics we are told to avoid. God, creation, afterlife, conversations on spirituality and religion, in our minds, don't seem to have any apparent utility. So much so that no one deems it necessary to ask me why I, as a practicing Muslim, step out of my day-to-day -day activities to pray, or that the biggest motivation for studying computer science for me comes from my religion. More often than not, our religion and spirituality is practiced in the confines of our bedrooms. We are afraid to share the values we were taught because it might offend others, call it a repercussion of the scientific era, or because we believe these conversations may lead to animosity, heated debates, arguments, I would like to make the case that avoiding the differences and similarities between ourselves leads, at best, to a brittle and artificial unity, and at worst, to blatant intolerance in our communities. In any case, it thwarts the potential of our partnerships, whether it be a group project at school or a multi-million dollar deal at a company. These conversations on where we have come from and where we are going are so fundamental to the way that we work and conduct ourselves in our professional and personal lives, our friendships and relationships, that it becomes essential to have conversations on our beliefs, values, and worldviews to create a more understanding world. Since 2018, I have participated in weekly dialogues with students of other faiths at MIT. When I joined the Adir interfaith community at this institute, I was a bit skeptical. I joined as per the recommendation of my Muslim chaplain and was primarily set on dispelling myths and misconceptions of my faith of Islam. So how would I go on to benefit from dialogue? Over the past two years, I have experienced incredible growth in the way that I communicate with others. How? Now I am better able to listen, to empathize and understand, rather than to persuade and impose my own view. It has informed so much of my practice of my religion and its relationship with other faith traditions. As someone who grew up Muslim with not so many non-Muslim friends, I am now aware of my inherent assumptions and now experienced holy envy, loving a practice of another group and incorporating it into my own worldview. People often believe that these conversations happen simply for the sake of conversion, but it has only motivated, strengthened, and empowered my love for humanity and our shared unity. My Mormon friend Hope reminds me to pray my five daily prayers. My Hindu friend Sarbari keeps my values as a Muslim in check. And my friend Jay, who is agnostic, reminds me to reflect on my day and the origins of my morality. At the same time, each one is respectfully able to question my worldview and assumptions and allow me to reflect on the worldview that I choose for myself. My experience with interfaith dialogue is encompassed in a very special relationship that I have with Hope Dargan. Hope and I met in a class on Islam and the Middle East. After class one day, Hope came up to me and suggested that we should grab lunch as she didn't have a Muslim in her dear small group and wanted to learn from my experiences. Hope challenged me with a series of tough questions on my faith. And at the very beginning of our conversation, we presented the very best version of our faith to one another. Over time, as we realized the essence of a deer, we began to become more vulnerable with one another and realized that indeed we both had challenges and struggles with certain aspects of our faith. Although we didn't intend on it for the past two years, Hope and I have continued to grab weekly lunches. On the surface, 
our friendship doesn't make much sense. As a hijabi Muslim woman in a bisexual Latter-day Saint, we grew up in very different communities with a very different set of beliefs and values and you could even say our personalities even aren't that similar. But we both are very determined, loyal, have a strong commitment to our faith, and can relate as we navigate the differences between culture and religion. Hope and I have also been able to share many practices with one another. During the holy month of fasting, Ramadan, for Muslims, Hope has attended community dinners to break fast with me and has even fasted a couple days of the month. I have attended her services and have engaged with many of her community members. Together, we organized the Muslim Latter-day Saint dinner where others can engage in conversations similar to ours and for the past two years have organized Adir's Interfaith Banquet Dinner where MIT students can engage in interfaith dialogue. Adir has taught us to explore different sets of values and find meaning in what is most important to us. It has taught us to respectfully engage in dialogue by setting the motivation for conversation and developing signals to indicate when certain people are uncomfortable with the topic of conversation. Hope and I had misconceptions of one another's faith traditions that we were able to dismantle with simple conversations. We have seen in recent history the consequences of misconceptions and intolerance of religion in society. For example, anti-Semitism in Europe and the Holocaust happened only half a century ago, and we see a rise of Islamophobia in this country I call my home, as well as my country of origin in India. We need to look past media and stereotypes and take control of the narratives that we believe in. If we hope to dismantle the wall that divides us, we need to take the hand of the person on the other side, dismantle the misconceptions together, and experience an open-hearted connection with the other. So if we, in our busy universities, can take some time to understand who we are our beliefs and values, and our motivations in safe spaces, we can make a lot more progress as a society and inculcate a spirit of cooperation between different faiths and realize we are a lot more similar than we are different. Coming back to the question of what interfaith dialogue means to me, I'm a graduate student at MIT studying robotics. Surprisingly, my work in interfaith dialogue is actually not too disconnected from my technical field. Every day, I think about how robots can continually learn into the future while retaining previous experiences and learning new skills. Eventually, myself, as well as my colleagues, will have to begin to consider the value system that a robot operates with. For example, if a robot takes part in a negotiation, it will have to choose whether or not it is ethical to deceive or not deceive, or whether something that it says to its counterpart will be deemed as offensive. All of these decisions that a robot or artificial agent makes are inherently biased by the value system that may or may not be influenced by a pre-existing religion. These are all decisions that technologists will have to make in the future. And I see interfaith dialogue playing a huge role in the key research objectives that I create in the future. At the end of the day, most of us would like to make an impact on this world, acquire an education, have a family, live a comfortable life. These are all objectives we share, whether we are Muslim, Hindu, Christian, or atheist. Conversations on the objectives we have chosen for ourselves and how we hope to achieve these objectives are so fundamental to the way that we interact with one another on a daily basis. Students especially, we spend most of our time consumed by a problem set or solving a really big research problem. So I leave you with this. If we, as MIT, in one of the most diverse and talented universities in the world 
are not contemplating the meaning of our existence, the origins of our morality, and the value sets that we have chosen for ourselves, who else will? Thank you.